Um, what, what are you going to be presenting about today for us, Alex? Hi, Chuck. Thanks very much. Yeah, today we're going to discuss about mobile search done right, common UX pinfalls and best practices. All right. So did you know that 86% of the population uses a smartphone? Those 7 billion of devices connected to the internet represent 55% of the worldwide traffic, with over 70% in Africa and Asia, a bit less in North America, where mobile only represents one third, and somewhere in, in between in Europe with 53%. So we do see discrepancy in mobile usage between the regions, but this is for global traffic. When we do look more precisely across industries, we do see that, for example, there are industries like in retail that dominates their game with over 70%, with 73% of mobile web usage. So what does that teach us? Ultimately, that mobile is not anymore nice to have. You have to invest into a mobile-first experience if you want to stay ahead or take over on your competitors. I'm Alexandre Collin, and I'm your host for today. My passion for web and well-crafted experiences had brought me into different places, like working as a software engineer at Amazon Prime Team at the early days of smart TVs and video streaming, or at Algolia for the last nine years, where I had the opportunity, as Chuck said, to take on different roles, from product to customer-facing role, and where I had the opportunity to work with hundreds of customers, helping them building engaging search and discovery experiences. But bring, but this is what brings me here, and I'm keen on sharing some of that experience with you so you can yourself build more engaging experiences, hopefully helping your user better engage with your experience and seeing positive impact on your business metrics. But before we jump into the, the, the pro and cons or the, the best practices, let's remind ourselves that interacting with a mobile device is way different than a desktop. First of all, not only screens are smaller, but we also interact with our fingers, which are more to errors. Often we're on the move, facing connectivity issues and dealing with a distracting environment. Overall, that leaves us with less time, less passion, and less control over the website or mobile app we interact with. But not only this, we not, we're not all the same person with the same intent when browsing a website or a mobile app. We all have different domain expertise, like myself versus a doctor searching for medicines when I'm sick. Or tech savviness. I'm sure that all of us in this session are probably have different skills versus our parents or grandparents. But also context and objectives. I was uh, purchasing a pair of shoes recently. In so the first place, I went on a couple of websites and compared the different shoes. So the day after, I went back on one of them and actually placed an order. The day after, I came back again on that website and actually looked where my order was. So same website, three different intents. So before optimizing your UI UX, it's really important that you think in terms of user journey. Even more importantly, it's important that you understand your user. What are the goals and motivation? What are pains and friction that may be causing drops? But don't worry, there's no need to reinvent the wheel as we're a creator, creator of habits. We like using what we already know, and this is the case for UI as well. Result in that is that we can leverage better proven patterns which have benefited from your extensive research, either for industry-leading companies, such as Google or Amazon and others, or independent UX companies such as NN Group or Baymore. All right, let's jump into the 10 pinfalls and best practices when it comes to build an e-commerce mobile experience. Quick disclaimer, we won't have time to cover all in details as you can guess. So feel free to download this session and watch it at your own pace. Also, we're going to go through to many examples tailored primarily for e-commerce, but several of those best practices also are valid and beyond. Number one, search needs to be easy to find. Users expect to see the search on the top right, so make it visible, make it one tap away. Don't hide it behind a, a burger menu or any kind of navigation and make sure that it's visually stands so users don't really don't have to, to, to search for it on the UI. They just know where it is. As much as possible, try to avoid distraction near the search bar as well. This is a common uh, pinfall. People tend to put banners on the very top or like very contrasted icons nearby, 
And so that leads people to not find where the search icon is. In e-commerce, as over 60% of people start their session with search, it's a best practice to make it a predominant search box, like on Amazon, where it takes a full width. Actually, you've understood it well for over several years already. And when you do, make sure to use an explicit placeholder, informing your user what they can search for, but also making it very visible and standing out so in terms of contrast. Number two, once the user clicks on the search icon or fill, you want to make sure that you maximize the screen real estate. How? By putting your search input at the very top, using an autocomplete overlay. Because when it's user search, what matters to them the most are the results. And on a mobile, due to uh, mo screen constraints, result space is less than 50%. It's actually up to 43% on mobile web. A quick tip for me, um, always test your app or mockups on a real mobile because keyboard takes a lot of space and it totally changes the interface. Number three, once your user have actually identified where the icon is, a search functionality, have clicked on it, they land on a state which we call the empty query state when they haven't yet started typing something. But this state is a great opportunity to start inspiring them with popular searches, for instance, for your first time users, or displaying recent searches for people who have already interacted with with your search. It's also a good opportunity to provide quick access to additional functionalities like IKEA does to promote their image search functionality. Some other websites also use it to promote thematic pages like FAQ entries and others. Number four, get users with query suggestion. Well, the instant search result page pattern where every product gets updated at every keystroke is very convenient on desktop. It's way more challenging to use on, on mobile due to, again to the limited screen size. So best practice is instead to display six to eight query suggestion that includes recent searches, but also in category suggestion in case you have a very broad catalog, allowing your user to go straight away into your query plus the category they selected. And you may have been wondering what this small icon, this small arrow on the right is. This is what we call the tap ahead. This pattern is very convenient for users who know about it, as it allows them to fill the query they tap on. So it won't submit the query, but it will just fill it in. So it is their input, and they can continue uh, refining the query they type. Return results from the first keystroke. That reinforces the sentiment of speed and control for the user. And don't miss on using contrasted highlighting. You would be surprised how many websites do highlighting but use light gray, which is not very visible. And last, support non-product searches. It becomes a must have. People expect to search for query suggestions, brands, category, but also content from FAQ. So don't miss on this. Number five, results page must have. On the result page, you want to persist the search query. This is really a must have. Not only it informs the user about what they're searching, uh, what we're searching right now in the context, but also gives them a direct access to the query so they can refine it once or multiple times. On the same way, you want to provide easy access to sorting and filtering, like on this website where clicking this icon will pull the option for me to sort uh, across different options. Here I can access all the filters, and I do have a selection of the most popular filters already popping up here on the horizontal list. Once you've done this, you also want to maximize space and legibility of your product thumbnails. Um, displaying info as much as you can. Reviews, reviews are really important. People, they, they care about reviews and how many people have actually reviewed a product. And also brilliant swatches when that makes sense, like color. You want to make that visual, easy to interact with. Number six, adapt the layout to the content type. We can divide that in two categories, visually driven results and spec driven results. On the left, this is a case, for instance, of media, where you, those are visually driven content and you can leverage the visuals to best display the results, like in an horizontal list in a media app. But this is also true on e-commerce, where an opportunity for the website owner is to display them in a grid, really leveraging the visual and helping the user to make a choice based on it.
But there are also cases or products where um, users make decisions based on specification, on product attributes. This is what we call spec-driven. In that case, we have a screen on the right. It's usually better to, um, to go with a, a list. And oftentimes, websites do offer the possibility between switching between one or the other. Number seven, display feature on an overlay, providing instant filtering. Again, this is with the idea of reinforcing that, um, that speed sentiment, like this impression of speed. With instant search, we now have the technology to be able to refresh every results on the back of the scene whenever a user interacts with any of the filter option. Imagine I click on brand, I select a brand, the results will be automatically updated. And this is the case, for example, with our library instant search. So by doing so, keep the panel open and refresh the results on the back. This is why it's a good practice to just like display the panel, not full width, but keep some space to actually see the results updated. When the user actually refine results, show them in an overview. So you can provide them with a graph of what has been refined and give them access to clear them all at once or one by one. Don't miss on the opportunity to collapse filters by default. So users don't have to actually scroll extensively to see what is offered to them to refine the scope. And in the same idea, just display relevant facets. There's no need to display facets about like a TV size if you're searching for a vacuum cleaner. Of course, it makes sense, but it, it's important to take care of this. And you want to order them by order of popularity. And last, make sure that you provide a sticky button to applying on those filters. So users, again, don't have to scroll and try to find where they should apply them. Number eight, let your user easily iterate on their search. How? By providing easy access to the current query and current refinement. Some websites do it using a sticky, uh, a sticky menu on the bottom to access sort filters. You can also um, use a sticky uh, header showing the query and the, and the refinements, either always open or just on scroll up. Number nine, you want to keep your user in control. Infinite scroll is a great pattern on native mobile because you have this menu at the bottom, so you can at any time navigate. But on mobile web, it only prevents user to access a footer or any additional content. So it's not the best. Instead, we see more and more websites use show more and even use the progress bar to inform the user where they actually are in regards of the set they're looking for, like here on IKEA. So this allows user to access a footer, related content, and related searches. And last, no results should not be a dead hand. So first recommendation is go with a robust search engine, an engine that can handle best typo tolerance, synonyms, concept matching, like as we provide with Algolia neural search. So you want to avoid at any cost a no result page so your user don't have to deal with this. In addition to have going with a robust search engine, you, you can also teach your user about what they can search. This is why using an explicit placeholder is helpful. But if it do happen, you have to have users on that page, a good practice is to try to inform them on how they can rephrase their query or help them removing active features. Like here, I, I search for less than $10 on target.com. And that, this is what led me on this page. Ultimately, as a last fallback, you want to show popular and featured category so they can continue their exploration journey and not be locked. As you can see, that's a lot of recommendation. It's hard to keep them top of mind when you're building your UI. With that in mind, this is why we invested in building the first search and discovery UI kit that we actually made available on the Figma community and has already been downloaded by 5,000 people. So I can only invite you to do the same and check it out. This has been designed for designers, but also developers. So everyone can really leverage those best practices. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and you got some learnings. I'd be happy to continue with this conversation with you either by email or on social media. I'll just that to reach out. And in the meantime, I'm going to answer any question in the Q&A. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Appreciate all of those tips uh, learned from talking to customers and you know from being on the inside and the outside. Um, one question from me. 
the UI kit is super cool for designing um, mobile applications. Uh, do the widgets in the UI kit map to widgets within any of our, our front end libraries? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Jack. Um, there, there's not a one one mapping at that stage. This is ultimately where we, we want to be uh, in the future. But uh, the UI kit does take into account what's uh, easily feasible with Algolia by using instant search library and autocomplete uh, as presented by Imogen earlier today. Excellent. But um, you could obviously take these best practices and apply them building with Flutterflow or any any mobile correct. development platform. Yes, this is tailored more toward e-commerce at this stage, but many of those practices like apply beyond. Right on. Very cool. Uh, we got a question from Michael Beckwith, and I will preface this by saying that um, he asked this before you started showing about filters. Um, but it is a question around filter UI design and, you know, sort of preferences for using sliding panels versus using hamburgers. I know you kind of throughout, uh, it seems like a sliding panel is kind of your preferred approach for handling complex filtering, right? Yeah, so we, we do see emerge a, a new pattern called the bottom sheet as well, uh, as it was presented during the Flutter Flow presentation. This is another way to display a panel. I think the, the UX best practice here is to make sure that this overlay doesn't take on the full screen. Otherwise, it, some user may forget that it's an overlay and they may lack context. And also because once you get to implement instant uh, search and instant refinement, if you do overlay 100% of your screen, you do miss this opportunity to inform the user mm. that something has happened behind the scene. Um, so either the side panel or the bottom sheet works. But just it's important to keep those recommendations in mind. I guess that makes sense. Like if you've got the sliding panel out, you can see that something happened behind. But if you can't actually see the results change, then it's not really going to exactly. help you yeah. as much. Excellent. Uh, I'm just going to check through the chat real quick and see if there's any other uh, questions here. I think we're kind of at the end of questions specific to you. And yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and, and let you go, Alex, but thank you so much for those tips. Very much appreciate it.